All right, so Deuteronomy chapter 22, uh, you know, it's just a lot of covering a lot of, uh, you know, just day to day matters, how things were to be handled. Of course, uh, we've been seeing a lot of that in the previous chapters, but I'll jump right into it here in verse 1 and where it says, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them unto thy brother. And if thy brother be nigh unto thee, or if thou know him not, then thou shalt bring, thine, uh, bring it into, unto thine house, and it shall be with thee until thy brother seek after it. So, of course, this is returning to the fact if somebody loses something, you weren't just to take it say, oh, it's mine now and, and too bad for them. No, you were to take it until somebody came looking for it. Whether you said, hey, I know who this is, you know, then you would return it unto them when it was most convenient or when the next time they came looking for it. Or if, if you didn't know whose it was, you know, you would hang on to it and assume that the owner thereof was going to come looking for it. So that did not make it your own. And it says here in verse 3, In like manner shalt thou do with his ass, and so shalt thou do with his raiment, and with all lost thing of thy brothers, which he hath lost, and thou hast found, shalt thou do likewise. Thou mayest not hide thyself. <coughs> and, that, and he says in verse 4, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or his ox fall down by the way, and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt surely help them to lift them up again. So again, this is kind of a, you know, how would we apply this today? Of course, we don't have these beasts of burden in our lives. You know, many of us have probably never even seen these animals, you know, aside from a National Geographic or something like that. Uh, what would be equivalent? What would be the equivalent today? Well, whenever I read verse four, I always think about, you know, you see the guy in traffic who's run out of gas or you know is pushing his car. I always feel compelled, like it's my 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 God-given duty to pull over and jump out and help that guy. Now, do I always do that? No, but you know, after reading, I'm convicted. You know, and and if if you don't get anything else tonight, you know, let this let this be the one thing you get. You know, help that guy out. You know, pull over, help him get it out of there. Now, a lot of times somebody's already beat me to it, and or they look like they got it. It's a small car, you know, they've got it under control. I can keep going. So, um, <coughs> but I think that would be, you know, we could apply. You say Deuteronomy 20, 20, 22, What are we reading that for? You know, hello. This was written a long time ago. Well, these are principles that we apply today. Yeah. You know, this concept of you know finding something that's not yours. Does that not happen? Happens all the time, you know, especially in, in church. You know, people are constantly leaving things behind. I mean, all the time, people are always leaving things behind in church. <laughs> but, uh, you know, even recently, somebody, you know, left a phone behind. You know, very expensive. Uh, it was like a Samsung Galaxy, I don't know, S whatever. It was a nice phone, expensive phone. And the guy came looking for it. And we had to say, look, man, it's not here. He goes, well, I left it right back here. By the DVDs, in fact, he had like a, he had some kind of proof. The last time it was on, it was right here, and it was gone. You know, so let that let that be a lesson to you. Pe just because people are in church, don't assume everybody in church is honest. That they might not just get sticky fingers, you know, and, and get the five finger discount at your you know at your expense, and you know put something in their pocket that doesn't belong to them and walk out the door with it. It happens. And, you know, people have a lot of different ways of justifying that to themselves, even in church, you know. But when you find something that's clearly not even church property, you know, not that it's right to steal church property. I mean, that's God's. I mean, why would you want to, I mean, if you're going to steal from anybody, you know, <laughs> don't let it be God. You know, but if you find something that doesn't belong to you, you know, you are to return that. You know, that doesn't make it yours. This, you know, we grow up with the saying, finders, keepers, losers, weeper, we, losers, weepers, not biblical. Okay, that is, you know, that is not biblical. You know, steal that is what's considered stealing according to the Bible. If you find something that doesn't belong to you, it's it's your duty to hang on to it or or to, if you know who, whose it is, you know, give it back. Uh, you know, I remember my wife and sister in law, I can't remember how much it was, but they stumbled, they were out on a walk and they stumbled across, I think it was an envelope or something, but it had a significant amount of money. It wasn't like, you know, it didn't make them rich. I mean, you know, obviously, you've seen us, right? <laughs> But it was, a I mean, it was a large portion. I mean, if you lost that amount of money, you'd be bummed. You know, you'd be really put out. And so what, what did they do? You know, they took it down to the sheriff's office and they left it there. They said, hey, we found this money on this street right here at these crossroads. And they said, well, if nobody comes back for it in X amount of days, you know, obviously they're not looking for it and then you can have it. So that's kind of how society works today. You know, and, and that's the thing. You know, we even have in church, we have a, a, a lost and found bin. You know, when people lose, lose things or leave them behind, Coats, you know, jackets, purses, you know, water bottles, sometimes smartphones, all kinds of things. People leave them behind all the time. And we make sure that we get those things back to those people and just say, oh, that's mine now, right? So when you find something that doesn't belong to you, you know, don't assume that it, that makes it yours. And <laughs> really what it comes down to is, 
you know, you're, you're helping your brother in Christ. You know, stealing is not, people, you know, I think, I think our society makes light of stealing. But stealing is a very uh, destructive uh, a sin to the, per to the victim. I mean, when you have something stolen from you, it's not just frustrating. I mean, it, it can be very expensive to replace things. It can cost you, I mean, that's time and money that you put into that. You know, you might have to work more hours. Maybe it's something you needed for your job. You know, maybe it's something you needed for your family. It was something very important to you. Or even if it was just some frivolous toy. I mean, you still spent your hard-earned money on that. When people take things that don't belong to them, that's, you know, that's very hurtful. And that hurts people. But, you know, the other concept that we see here is not just returning things that don't belong to you, but also just this concept of being willing to help other people, as we saw in verse 4. You know, he's saying, don't hide thyself, you know. If you see his ox fall down by the way, don't be like, oh, you know, out of sight, out of mind. He's like, no, you, you saw it. You know what's going on. You need to go help him. And, you know, this is a principle that's reiterated in the New Testament. And if you would, go to Galatians chapter 6. And we'll see that reiterated there. <clears throat> you know, we should be willing to go out of our way to help a brother in Christ. And not only that, but we'll see we'll even just peop unsafe people. You know, we should not have this attitude of, well, you know, I can't be inconvenienced to help somebody. You know, we should be a people that are willing, ready, and able to lend a hand when it's necessary. You know, my family, after six years, just recently moved. You know, and I'm sitting there scratching my head going, all right, who's my friend? <laughs> That's how you find out who your friends are, you know, when you move. <laughs> you say, who's going to come help me move? And I'm, I'm thinking, who's my victim? You know, who am I going to come up to? And say, hey, what are you doing? You always, you always preface it like that. You say, hey, what are you doing Saturday? They're thinking, oh, man, he's about to ask me to some <laughs> barbecue. You know, he's going to ask me to go do something fun. And you're like, hey, you want to help me move? And they're like, ah. Uh, what are you doing Saturday? Nothing. I'm wide open. Great. Want to help me move? You know, I just remembered something came up. Let me check with my wife. You know, uh, you know I forgot to check my account. Oh, it turns out, you know, that's when you find out who your real friends are. They're like, yeah, I'll be there. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate. I didn't even have to ask. I just mentioned to a guy, hey, I'm, I'm moving. And he's like, oh, you need any help? You know, he was just ready to jump in, and, and he came and gave me a hint. But, uh, you know, that's the kind of attitude we ought to have. We had an attitude that says, hey, I'm going to help people that have a need, whether it's moving or, you know, whatever it is. Life has all kinds of things that come up, a lot of things that we need an, an extra hand uh, in, and we should be willing to do that. The Bible says there in Galatians chapter 6, if you look in verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, what is the law of Christ? Love thy neighbor as thyself. Do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. You know, that's a principle that is considered the law of Christ. And because that is the law of Christ, you know, that's not just something we say that we believe, but we actually have to act that out by bearing one another's burdens, by helping those around us. Now, keep something in Galatians. In fact, if you look at verse 10, just go to verse 10. He says, as we therefore have, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. So we should be even more willing to help people within the church, but you know, we don't also want to develop this, you know, uh, you know, uh, elitist type of attitude. We say, well, I'm going to help everybody in church because of my brother in Christ, but everybody else, you know, they can just go pound sand if they need something. No, he's saying, you know, as we have opportunity, do good unto all men, yeah. not just within the, not just within the church. You know, but to, to, to the stranger, to our neighbors, to the unsaved, that we should be willing to go out and help them as well. Now, keep something in Galatians 6 and go over to Matthew chapter 7. So we should be willing to do good to the unsaved as well, not just the saved. <clears throat> you know, and another a big way we can do this, even on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe we don't have, you know, is, is just to have a good attitude towards the unsaved. Not just, you know, oh, I'll be nice to them if they really need something. What about just the yeah, common courtesy? You know, that's something that lacks today. Just, just uh, the, 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 the willingness to say thank you, hello, open a door, hold a door open. Uh, you know, those type of things. That we should help with that as well. You know, we should be a courteous people. We should be looking for opportunity to, to be a good testimony to others and to help other people and to be polite and kind and gentle unto all men. So, you know, the overarching principle here is to avoid being inconvenienced and to help somebody in need. You know, we're not to avoid, you know, being inconvenienced. You know, we should not try to go out of our way to make sure that, you know, nobody asks me to move, help them move or, you know, no one ever asks me to help them, you know, change a tire on their car or whatever it might be. You know, we shouldn't be the type of people that 
are just going to throw a fit, you know, if, if we have to help somebody else out, you know, and there's nothing, uh, you know, immediately coming back to us. You know, we're not going to immediately benefit from helping somebody else. He says there, look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would do uh, uh, that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. I mean, that's, you know, that's what the, all the, the law and the prophets, they hung on the, these two commandments. Love the, Lord, uh, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and love thy neighbor as thyself. Right? This is the law and the prophets. He's saying here, whatever you want men to do to you, that's what you need to do unto them. And go over to Matthew chapter 22. Because here's this, the principle of, the, you've, we've probably all heard the saying, what goes around comes around. Right? Who's heard that before? That's a biblical principle. Now you won't find, there, you know, that's not in the book of Second Opinions or something. You know, that, it, but it is a principle that's in the Bible. What goes around comes around. Whatever you want men to do unto you, that's what you need to do unto them. Because what goes around comes around. If you're going to Matthew 22, I'll read you Matthew, or Psalm 18, excuse me. It says, with the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With the upright, thou wilt show thyself upright. You know, a big reason why we ought to show mercy unto other people is because we want God to show mercy unto us. You know, if we fail to show mercy unto other people, you know, God might just say, well, what goes around comes around. And, and we might, or we might even need mercy from another person. You know, and say, hey, I, you know, maybe we get into trouble or we get out of sorts or whatever. But we find ourselves in a position where now we need mercy. And if we've been unmerciful people, you know, there's a good chance that we're not going to receive the mercy that we want. So we should always be looking for opportunities to show mercy unto others. We should always be looking for opportunities to be inconvenienced by other people and to help them out. Why? Because we want men to do unto us as we would do unto them. <clears throat> and, you know, that's not, just a, that's not just God putting that out there as an offer. Like, hey, if you want good things that come back to you, do good unto others. You know, that's not an option that's on the table. That's a principle. That's a law of this world, of how this, the world works, how life works. And that's how God works. That if you, whatever you do, good or bad, unto somebody else, it comes back around. God repays those things back to us. Look at Matthew 22, verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I mean, that's a heavy, that, when, God's, when, when Jesus Christ is putting that commandment as number two, but only second to loving God, you know, we ought to stop and take notice and really let that sink in and really let that affect the way we conduct ourselves in the world with brethren, with the unsaved, with everybody that we come in contact with. <clears throat> so we should not only love and do well unto the, our brethren and our strangers, but even unto our own enemies, okay? You know, and go over to Matthew chapter 5. You know, even our own personal enemies, we should do good unto them. You say, you're crazy. No, it's Bible. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 39. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Jump down to verse 43. Ye have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, this is Jesus speaking, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Now, of course, we have to put the caveat in there of your enemies. Okay? This is, we're not talking, that the people will say, oh, then, then we should love everybody. Do not I hate them which hate thee, O Lord. Yeah, I hate them with perfect hatred. You know, I hate the enemies of the Lord, but my own personal enemies, I'm supposed to love. That's what the Bible teaches. So he's saying, look, love your enemies, not, not God's enemies. Okay, that's the line we have, to, we have to kind of make that differentiation today because people get confused about that. But he's saying, love your enemies. Okay, bless them that curse you, do good unto them that hate you. Again, that hate you, not the haters of God. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain unto the just and to the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? You know, it's real easy to be nice to somebody who's nice to you. It's real easy to, to, to smile and shake hands with somebody who'll smile and shake hands with you. It's real nice to do good things unto people that you're like and fond of. But what we're, how, you know, that's not exactly difficult, is it? You know why that guy was so eager to come and help me move? It's because he likes me, if you can believe that or not. <laughs> Because I actually do have some friends. 
you know. <coughs> but he's saying, look, you know, if, you, if you're just going to be nice to everybody that's nice to you, big deal. You know, like, that's not, what do you want? A, you want a cookie? You want a golden star for that? Right. Pat on the back? That's not hard to do. That's just common courtesy. The real tough part is when, you're, when you have somebody that hates you, when you have somebody that wants to persecute you and revile you and, and do all the, and, and, and is just mean and nasty towards you. The Bible says love that person. Love them too. <coughs> that's when things, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road. He says, and if you salute your brother and only, what do you more than others? I mean, even the most wicked people in this world, they have their, they have their friends. I mean, go, go down, let's go over to the Hells Angels headquarters over here, just south of here. And, I mean, those people are involved in all kinds of wickedness. But I guarantee you, within their circle, they're slapping each other in back and calling each other brother and they're glad to see one another. I mean, even, they, even the Hells Angels know how to greet one another kindly, or, you know, at least affectionately. You know, what do you more than others? It's not that big a deal to just be nice to people who are nice to you. Do not even the publican so? Do not even the, do not even the Hells Angels do that? He says, be therefore perfect. Now, what is he saying? Be therefore perfect. Remember in James, he's talking about you know, that you may be, you may be perfect and, and entire wanting nothing. So the use of perfect here, meaning you're not lacking anything, right? He's saying, be perfect. You know, don't just love your friends and your family and your brethren in Christ. You know, love everybody. That's not, you know, the enemy of God, obviously. Love your neighbor. Love your brother. Love your enemy, even. He's saying, you do all these things. Be perfect in this area. Love everyone, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. So he's saying you need to be this way because that's how God is. You know, so I think sometimes we forget that. You know, we knock on some door, we try to give the gospel to somebody who, who doesn't, isn't interested or maybe is a little rude, and, you know, we instantly think, well, you know, I hope, I hope you know, God, you, you, God's, you just go straight to hell. People can get a bad attitude. But that's not God, God's attitude. Right. God loves that person. Right. No matter how badly they might have treated you at the door. <clears throat> and really, it, it's not that bad. I mean, I mean, come on. What's the worst you've ever had? You know, people just, you know, I'm cooking dinner, you know, or whatever. They're, they're lame excuses and they're just impatient. That's really the worst of it. I mean, we've all got our stories, you know, of people who did worse than that. But even then, God loves them. He maketh his rain to fall on the just and the unjust, doesn't he? You know, he sends it upon bo both of them. He causeth his son to rise on the evil and on the good. You know, he does good unto both. Right? And he's saying here, look, you need to be perfect in this area. You need to be like God in heaven. So to love your enemy, you know, and to, and to, and to, and to love them that hate you, you know, that's a God-like quality. To love them that would, that would you know, uh, 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 despitefully use you. Okay? So this, and, and, and why this is important, why we need to take the time to preach about this and make sure we understand this is because it's in light of the concept of reaping what you've sown, okay? Like I said earlier, what goes around comes around. And these two teachings are interwoven, all right? So if we mistreat our enemies, you know, God will recompense the same if and when we're out of sorts with him. What if we get out of sorts with God? You know, and, and like we need the mercy, or we, you know, God's going to say, well, I remember the way you treated this guy when he was out of sorts with me. And it goes around, comes around. That's why it's important to understand this and to get it and to practice it and to live it because it's interwoven with this concept of reaping what you've sown. Go back to Galatians chapter 6. If you cut something there, we'll see it. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. If you remember Galatians chapter 6, where we read in verse 2, says, bury another, one, another one's burdens and so fulfill you the law of Christ. He said in Galatians uh, 6, verse 10, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially in the household of faith. Why? Why is it that it's so important? Well, look at verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall, uh, uh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Let's not hide from being inconvenienced to help somebody out or return things that aren't ours, or let's not hide ourselves from our neighbor who's lost, who's, who's, whose ox or ass has fallen down in the way. Let's not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That's why, we, as we therefore have opportunity, we should do good unto all men, because we reap what we've sown. So we should always, we should be thankful 
when somebody wants to inconvenience us by asking us to help them with a favor. We should say thank you because now I can sow some good seed. Now I can reap something good in my life. Now this is going to come back on me. You know, not, not just go, oh, I guess, you know, I guess I have to. Bible says I should help you out. So I'll do my Christian duty. You know, and I guess, you know, if that's your attitude, that's better than nothing. But really, the attitude we should have is, yeah, I'd love to help you move. Because one day I'm going to move. I'm going to call you. <laughs> or you know what? Or somebody's going to volunteer to come help me. You know, I don't, I've helped people move. People have asked me, and I, you know what? I had to move, and somebody just volunteered to come help me. You didn't have to ask them. You know, that's things coming back around. So that's, what, that's the type of attitude that we should have, is that we should always be looking for opportunities to be inconvenienced by other people to, so that we can sow good seeds so that we can have a harvest later. We should do well unto all men because we reap what we've sown. Let's go ahead and move on here in Deuteronomy chapter 22. He kind of, Deuteronomy 22, he kind of just hits uh, several different things. So there's some, gear, you know, there's some gear changes here. And you know, we move from one thing to another. And verse 5, of course, is that uh, you know, very popular verse uh, where it says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall man put on a woman's garment, <coughs> for all that do so are an abomination to the Lord thy God. A couple things on this. You know, first off, it says that people that do this, that they are an abomination. Okay? Look there at the end. All that do so are abomination of the Lord thy God. It doesn't say the doing of it is an abomination. It doesn't say the garment's an abomination. He says the person that does this is an abomination unto the Lord, Lord thy God. It's right there in black and white in our Bibles. <coughs> but what he's saying here, and really I don't feel like, you know, whole sermons have been preached about this. And if we have any common sense, I really don't feel like a, you know, a, a lengthy uh, explanation is needed tonight. I think probably everybody in here is probably familiar with this, this, uh, this doctrine. But we will touch on it because, hey, it's in Deuteronomy. You know, this, isn't, this isn't some watered-down Baptist church where we're just going, oh, <laughs> well, I don't know what that means, and just move on. Right? We're going to preach this verse because it's in the Bible. You know, so what is he saying? Or one, you know, cross-dressing is an abomination. Dennis Rodman putting on his wedding dress and walking out in front of everybody is an abomination unto God. All these freaks that are walking around dressed like women, putting on skirts and women's garments, abomination unto God. Amen. Mark it down. That's what the Bible says. And it's real easy to amen that part. You know, a lot of people are going to disagree with that. They're going to say, yeah, the guy who's dressing up like a woman and walking out in public you know, is an abomination to God. And in most Baptist churches, you can get an amen with that. Pretty easy. It's that other part we don't like, yep. where it says a woman that puts on a, a man's garment. And then we all start scratching our head, but what's a man's garment? You know, what could that possibly be? Right. Gee, and then, we, and then we get in these big, long debates about what a, what a man's garment is. And it, and, but again, common sense doesn't have to, doesn't take us, it doesn't, you know, it just leads us to an answer very quickly. You know, we could just go, go to any public restroom and look at the door. How do they, how, you know, they put an image up there. And what's the woman wearing? A dress. What's the man wearing? Pants. Right? That's, is it the shirt that, does, when you go to the restroom and you go, which one do I go in? Do you look at the top half? And go, well, I'm wearing a shirt. This must be my bathroom. Now, if you're a target, that probably works. Right? right? <laughs> but no, you look at the bottom half. You go, does it go like this? Or does it go like this? And that's how you go, well, I belong in that one. So it's talking about the lower half of the dress. I mean, think about it. If we were saying a guy was cross-dressing, a guy's in drag, right? What's he wearing? Yep, right. He's wearing a dress. That's what he puts on to, to dress like a woman. So what would a woman put on to dress like a man? Pants. That's what she put on. What other garment could it possibly be? And here's the thing, pants have historically been a man's garment. And, you know, it was even illegal in this country at one time for a woman to put on a pair of pants. People would get, a, a women would get arrested for cross-dressing by putting on a pair of slacks. You know, well, that's because they didn't have women's jeans back then. You heard that argument? You know, that's, so, that's, that's stupid. Think about the fact that you have to actually make that, specify that. Well, these are women's jeans. Oh, well. Well, why don't we make a man's dress? And I'll start wearing that, and it'll be just fine. I'll get some camo, nice camo one, some cargo pockets. 
Maybe a hammer loop in it. You know, it could be made out of Kevlar. It's a man's dress, right? <laughs> Thank you. Somebody's getting it. No, that'd be wrong. That's not going to work. If I walked in here tonight wearing a man's dress, you know, anybody with any sense would walk up and leave. Yeah. They'd get up and they'd just say, sorry, Brother Corbin's lost his mind, man's dress. But, you know, what about the woman who's going to get up in the morning and pull on a pair of women's pants? Makes as much sense. Because, oh, oh you say it's not pants. Well, what is it? Then you tell me what the garment is that he's referring to here. I mean, I, wh what else could it be? Historically, it's, pants have been a man's uh, a garment, historically. Just, it, it's the way it is. We see it even in the Bible. Daniel chapter 3. You don't have to turn there. Then these men were bound, talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? The three holy children who were thrown into the fire furnace. These men were bound in their coats, their hosen, okay? And it's not talking about the hosen you're thinking, you know, with like the, the little nylon, whatever. It's talking about pants. Their hosen, their hats, and their other garments were cast in the midst of the fire furnace. Because people say, oh, they did, they, you know, pants are a recent invention. Like they couldn't figure out how to make two tubes of material and pull them over their legs. You know, but somehow they, they couldn't figure that out, but somehow they could make the seven wonders of the world or whatever. You know, they made the Great Wall of China, but they couldn't figure out how to make out pants until just recently, until Levi Strauss figured it out for the coal miners. Come on. <laughs> it's been around forever. Pants, it's not, the, it's not the most technologically advanced piece of, you know, clothing out there. You know, they made pants, and then shortly after that, they landed on the moon, right? It was just one, you know, one thing led to another. It's like, no, pants have, are real easy to figure out. <coughs> and thou shalt make the, Exodus 28, when God is talking about the, the priest's garments, what they're going to wear before the Lord when they go in and minister to him. Thou shalt make them linen breeches, Right? Breeches is an old word for what? Britches, which are what? Pants. You ever hear the saying, he guy, he's, he's too big for his britches? You know, guy, that's what it's referring to. He's too big, you know, it's pants. So pants are going back all the way back to Exodus. They've been around at least that long. So by the time we get to Deuteronomy, pants have been around. Okay, and that's why God's saying, look, a woman shall not put on a man's garment. You know, and it'd be really easy to just get up here and rip on, on all the guys that are cross-dressing today. And that's another sermon that should be preached and shall be preached at one point. But just as important that, and because again, what does it say at the end of the verse? All that do so are an abomination unto God. You can do that with what you will. If you want to pull your pants on as a woman in the morning. Think about that. that that's what you're doing. <coughs> that's what the Bible says. And what we have to ask ourselves, you know, if we bucket that and we don't like that, and, and, you know, that rubs us the wrong way. Well, then we have to ask ourselves a question. Who determines our standards? Does the world or does the word of God? Does the world tell us what's okay to wear and what's not okay to wear? Or is it the word of God? And that's really what it comes down to. Is what, what, what is our standard going to be? What the world allows? And I'll tell you something, the world is allowing a lot. I mean, <laughs> the world lets you get away with a lot when it comes to dressing. Is that really who you want it for your standard of dress? Is the world. The world that'll tell you it's okay to put on a Speedo and walk around in public. Ugh. <laughs> you know, I see faces, everyone's going, Ugh, you know. <laughs> exactly. But the world's saying, hey, nothing wrong with that. Right. Nothing wrong with a woman just standing out there half naked, walking around. As long as she's around a body of water, she can strip down her underwear. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as there's a big pool of water. It's, you know, what sense does that make? Well, it'd be wrong for her to answer the door like that in a swimsuit, but as long as there's a body of water, it's okay. This is the world's standards. They're all over the place. They don't make any sense. That's right. <coughs> and God, doesn't, God doesn't have this gray area. Woman's garment, appropriate on women. Man's garment, appropriate on men. Anybody who wants to go like this is an abomination. It's that simple. God doesn't have this gray area. <coughs> so... You, really what it comes down to is that as men and women, we should all have just one type of dress. And what is that? Modest clothing, gender appropriate and modest clothing. And if you would, go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I'm going to, so I do want to, I don't want, I want to wrap up this point on this, <laughs> with this passage. Do, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. You say, why, why, what is the big deal about a woman wearing pants? Well, one, it's a man's garment. But two, it's also immodest. 
Okay? Any, any woman or even man that's honest will tell you that when a woman puts on pants, it draws the eyes to other parts of the body other than the face, which is all the further a man's gaze needs to go if he's not married to her, is the face. <coughs> and this is, this, you know, if anyone's honest, and don't tell me they don't make, you know, women's pants that don't accentuate those lower parts of the body. Right. They absolutely do. <coughs> and there's whole, there's, I mean, I'm not, eh, I'm not even going <laughs> to, things are coming to my mind, you know, lyrics that I've heard that are just wicked about, and it's about women putting on pants. <coughs> In 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. And I want you to pay attention to these words. Without wrath and doubting. God's telling men how he wants them to pray. Okay? And he tells he wants them to pray without wrath and without doubting. And right after he says that, he switches over to verse 9 and says this, in like manner also, meaning in the same way, that just as men are supposed to pray without wrath and without, uh, without doubting, that women should adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. So God's giving them these, these dress standards for women about wearing modest apparel, not putting on, what was the, what was the phrase? The blitz, right? Remember that? Yeah. The bling and the glitz together, the blitz. <laughs> if you weren't here Sunday, you're like, what is this guy talking about? You know, not putting on, what does it say? The, the broided hair, the gold, the pearl, the costly array, getting all the name brand stuff. You know, and I have to confess, you know, Brother Hunter gave me a bunch of shirts and they're, they're great shirts. And I put one on. I was like, man, this shirt's nice. And it, was, it had that little polo guy, the Tommy Hilfiger. And I was almost like, oh, man, I don't know if I should be wearing this. <laughs> it's just so, because, you know, that's kind of like, or no, it's uh, Ralph Lauren or whatever. You know, that's kind of like the fancy shirt. I'm like, if anybody asks, I'll say it was given to me. You know. It's like, oh, what are you wearing that, that, that fancy shirt for, right? But he's saying, look, he doesn't want women, you know, making the, their wardrobe all about just catching everyone's attention. Because there's dressing immodestly in the sense that you're wearing things that aren't appropriate, you know, that are too revealing, things that are too tight, that aren't long and flowing, things that are drawing the eyes where they shouldn't be, that are accentuating certain parts of the body. That's one sense of modesty. But the other sense is you're wearing something, you know, you, 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 we've all seen the churches where the ladies, you know, they, they walk in and they have just the giant hats. You know, with like a whole floral arrangement up there, you know, and it matches all the way down to the shoes and they got the big pearl necklaces and all the, and their nails and everything just all done up. That's immodest. Why? Because you're drawing attention to yourself. He's saying that they should draw some modest apparel with shamefacedness. You know, shamefacedness is, you know, the concept of, you know, they don't want to draw attention to themselves. They'd be embarrassed if, if someone would give them undue attention over the way they looked. I'm not, now, again, I'm not saying that, you know, you should walk around, you know, dressed like you're in a little house of the prairie or something. Because, again, that would make you stand out, wouldn't it? Right. I mean, do we not see people dressed that way? They're not wearing anything revealing, you know, but they're wearing, you know, they're making a point of wearing just the, you know, the, you think about the, you know, the fundamental Mormons up in northern Arizona that are wearing just like, you know, head to toe, solid colored, you know, dresses. I, I don't know a lot about women's apparel, so I, I'm sure there's like a, a name for this, that dress, but we all know what I'm talking about. You know, they put the bonnet on. You know, if any lady in here put on a bonnet and one of those dresses and went out to Walmart, don't you think you'd be drawing attention to yourself? Yes. Absolutely you would. People would be going, what in the world? At Walmart, right? <laughs> you'd, be one, you'd, be, you'd, be, you'd be like one of the people of wa Walmart, <laughs> you know? You'd be on some meme somewhere or some Facebook. They'd be like the lady who was wearing the flesh-colored skin tight, you know, pants, and you were like, what is she, you know, is she wearing anything? And then you, in your bonnet, and your, you know, huge floral dress or whatever, I don't know what it is, what they call it, but your little house on the prairie dress, you know what I'm talking about? That would be just as immodest, all right? So God, you know, and when we start to preach about these things, when you start to preach about, you know, what women should wear, what they should wear, and, and, and get into all this, you know, there's a tendency sometimes for them to, that's where like, oh, don't you start talking about my dress. You're talking about how, what, what kind of clothes I wear. You know, does the Bible really say that? Is it really that big a deal? In like manner also, without wrath and without doubting. Don't get mad about it. Don't get angry and upset. And don't think that it's irrelevant or it doesn't apply. Don't doubt it. It's there. The Bible's clear. That a, ma that a man should not put on a woman's garment and just as much a woman should not put on a man's garment. 
So we should do these things without wrath and without doubting. Let's go ahead and move on, though, in Deuteronomy chapter 22. So, so far we talked about, you know, helping your neighbor out. Now we're, we got into dress standards, and now we're jumping right into, you know, conservancy. I mean, he's kind of covering all these different myriad of topics here, all these different topics. And he says there in verse 6, if a, bird's chant, if a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way, and any tree or on the ground, whether they be young ones or eggs, and the dam sitting upon the tree or upon the eggs, thou shalt not take the dam with the young, and thou shalt in any wise let the dam go, and take the young to thee, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest prolong thy days. So first thing you want to look at here is the fact he's saying, if this is something that comes by chance. You know, if you're just going, you're not out there hunting birds. You know, you're just walking by the way. And if it happens to cross your path, you know, if it's by chance in the way that you're going, <coughs> that you're not to, you find a, a, a bird that's sitting either on, 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 on hatchlings that have hatched or sitting on eggs. You're not to take everything and eat it, basically, as we're talking about. You're not just going to say, oh, fresh eggs. You know, oh, I'm going to, and you say, who would eat an egg with an embryo in it? Filipinos do it, right? There's, and ba, ba, does anyone know what it's called? Balut or something like that? I can't remember. But it's like a delicacy in some countries to actually eat a duck egg with a duck in it. Right. I, I don't know how they, I, hey, whatever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> They'd see us with real rubber duckies in the bathtub and be like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you know, they think we're weird for thinking they're cute. They're like, that's food. <laughs> but he's saying, look, he's, like, he's saying here, don't eat everything. Leave something there, right? And what, he, what this is teaching is conservation of wildlife, okay? Why? So that other people can have a chance to enjoy that, right? Now, what I want to point out here is in verse 7 where it says, I want, you to, I want to point out who it is that benefits. Why is God putting this law in there? Does God take care for oxen? No. It is written all together for our sakes, right. right? The same way with this law. This law isn't there because God cares about the little birdies and wants to protect them. Look there at verse 7 where it says, Thou shalt anywise let the dame go and the, take the young to thee, that it may be well with thee, and that thou may pro, pro, mayest prolong thy days. <coughs> so he's saying, look, the reason why you do this is so for your own good, Right? So how is that a benefit to us? Well, one, if you leave the, da the dame there, the dam there, she's going to produce more eggs. Yeah. And maybe next year you can have some more. Or maybe somebody else will come by chance and find some and get to enjoy that. Right? Instead of you just taking everything all at once. It reminds me of in Michigan, there was a certain time during the year where you could go out and pick morel mushrooms. Who knows what a morel mushroom is? The other people from up north. Delicious. It's like the steak of the mushroom world. Okay, if you ever get a chance. I mean, people go nuts up there. They have the Misik Mushroom Festival. You could sell them 50 bucks a pound. I mean, they just go crazy because they only come out for like a few weeks and you, it ha the temperatures have to be right. And all of a sudden, these mushrooms will pop up and you can go out in the woods and, if, and no, you, know, you have to find them on your own because no one will tell you where the, their spots are. Mm -hmm. But they say when you pick them, you should always tear them off at the root and put them in like a, a bag that has holes, like an un old onion sack so that the spores will shake out. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but why, why do they say that? So that other people can come and enjoy the morels too next year. So you're not just ripping them up by the roots and the spores aren't getting out. They're not going to be there next year. You know, and, and you could decimate the, the whole population that they're just, they're just gone. Whole, there's no crop next year. It's that principle that God's putting in, in the Bible here. He's saying, look, preserve this animal so that other people can enjoy it. And so that you, know, you can have more next year. Maybe you'll go by there in the next year and there'll be more eggs that you can enjoy. But really what, you know, this is, I believe is a good text verse for not being wasteful, but also for not, you know, and this is my opinion, okay? And I've talked to brethren about this and they have a different opinion. But in my opinion, poaching is wrong. I believe it's, it's you shouldn't do it. And people will say, oh, well, you know, that God made that, that's not God's role. I know I'm going to go shoot the king's duck, you know, or whatever. I, who are you? You know, you're, you know. They, they got this Robin Hood mentality, like, I'm gonna, who's going to stop me from killing the king's deer? And I get that. I understand that, right? But, look at, but look, look at the principle here of conserving something for so other people can enjoy it. I, you know, poaching is taking more than you need from wildlife, right? There's seasons that you can enjoy. And here's the thing. If, if poaching were legal, there wouldn't be anything left to hunt within a few years. I mean, sure. honestly. And, and here's the thing that people that are proponents of it is that they forget that it's sportsmen that wanted this to become law. 
They, they went to the federal government and said, will you please conserve our wildlife so that future generations can enjoy it? <coughs> so if we have this attitude of wasting, of poaching, of taking more than we need, you know, that's only going to come back and bite us. And again, it's not about the animal. It's not about poor little animals and, and help and saving them. You know, it's about, you know, you know, uh, it's about shooting yourself in the foot, you know, it's, uh, as, the man, as the saying goes. And you say, well, I don't know about that. You know, if, if we poached, you know, not, every hunt, not everybody hunts. If you're telling me I could go out in the woods and just shoot any animal year-round, as many as I wanted, every day, there'd be people out here, that's how they would live. They'd quit their jobs and go do that. Absolutely they would. Come on, they, you know they would. And an example of this is, is why you need to conserve wildlife is because of the fact, you know, a great example is the bison of the Great Plains. You know, when, when uh, there was, you know, the, the Native Americans that lived there, that sustained their people the entire time they lived there. And how did they treat those animals? They took only what they needed year by year and they followed them around. And they, they, they didn't go out and try to slaughter the whole herd at once. You know, and then just store all the meat. They followed the herd. They took what they needed. They used all of the animal, right? And then when the settlers came through, the rail the railroads came through, and all the guys are sitting there in the stagecoach with nothing better to do but just to just shoot target shoot buffalo from the train, and to go out there and take them, you know, or or hunt them and take only the hide and leave the the corp the rest of the animal to rot. They decimated those herds within a few decades. They nearly went extinct. And you're going to tell me today. That with all of man's, you know, our modern hunting equipment, with all of our ATVs and long-range rifles and scopes and gear, that guys aren't going to go out in the woods if it was legal and just decimate entire populations? Yep. You know they would. And that's why I believe that God has put this in here. To tell us, look, you need to leave some there. Don't take everything all at once. Yep. <laughs> you know, not to mention the fact that the Bible tells us to, you know, to submit ourselves to every ordinance for the, man's, for, uh, for, for the Lord's sake. We should submit ourselves to every ordinance for the Lord's sake. Now, obviously, if, if man's law is contrary to God's law, we go with God's. Amen. He is the ultimate authority. We obey God rather than men. But, you know, the speed limit on the freeway is not, is not contrary to God's law. It's an ordinance of man. It's put there for our own good, to keep people to, from going too fast and, and hurting each other, killing one another. So not all of man's laws are necessarily, you know, bad. They're good. They're there for a reason. And, uh, you know, I believe that our laws when it comes to wildlife, hunting, conservancy, and these things, they're good. They're there for a reason. Maybe they're, maybe they're a little inconvenient, but you know what? At least they're going to be, that leads going to leave animals there for the next generation to go out and enjoy. Because quite frankly, you know, do we really need to hunt today? No. I was just looking into buying a whole buffalo online. <laughs> a dead one, Okay. <laughs> I'm going to bring a buffalo home. <laughs> Honey, you got a new pet. His name's Bob, you know. I'm going train, I'm gonna learn to ride it, you know, and just ride around town. <laughs> no, I meant like, a, you know, one that was slaughtered, frozen, and sent to me, you know. I don't need to go hunt. That's a leisurely activity. That's something that we, we that's a hobby, right? That's something that we enjoy doing. So let's, let's preserve these things, you know. And you say, why are you preaching this? Because I've, I know Christians that have come to me and, and bragged about their poaching. And it makes me furious. And it makes you not very intelligent. <laughs> Let me just say this. If you're going to poach, don't tell anybody. Right. Don't tell people you're poaching. I, I told this guy this. Like, look, I don't agree with you, but you definitely shouldn't be telling people that you're right. poaching. Because you might tell the wrong guy who actually will call the DNR. You know, and next thing you know, they're knocking on your door and they're searching your house and taking your guns and finding you and everything that they can do. <coughs> So whether you agree with that or not, you know, just do us both a favor and don't tell me or anybody else about it. Because <laughs> I, I got it off my chest, all right? Now let's go to verse 8. Verse 8. When thou buildest a new house, uh, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof, that thou bring not blood upon thine house, if a man fall from thence. So this is just basically public safety. This is just something, hey, if you're going to build a house, you're not going to put people in dangerous situations. And I'm just not going to tell any stories of that exact thing happening to me. But <laughs> thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with thy verse seeds, lest the seed of thy fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown, and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Thou shalt not plow, plow with an ox and an ass together. 
Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. Now, verse 11 is one that the atheists and the phagnostics like to show, throw in our face. Oh, or are you wearing a polyester cotton blend shirt? <laughs> You're in violation of your own book, buddy. You know, and I'm always looking for the 100% cotton because in Arizona, that's what you want. But there's nothing wrong with me wearing this, you know, polyester cotton blend shirt tonight because that's not woolen and linen. Okay. And you say, why does God even have these laws? Why does God have a law like thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together? Is it because, you know, if you do that, that the, that, you know, the field's going to catch on fire and God's going to come down and, and, you know, punish you? No, it's symbolic. Okay. God is trying to put some, some symbology in their everyday life. God's putting things in their life to remind them of him and who they, who he is and who they are. And so they can be reminded of these things from day to day. The point of not plying with an ox and ass together is to not be un, as the you know not being unequally yoked with unbelievers. And I preached a sermon about that a little while ago. That's symbolic there that we are you know we, we don't want to yoke up with the world to do the Lord's work. Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts. Okay, what's that talking about when he's talking about woolen and linen? Well, he says about woolen and linen because. <coughs> Of the fact that wool, you know, what comes from what? An animal, a sheep, right? It's symbolic of faith, Amen. right? And then the linen comes from what? A plant, which is symbolic of works. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, he's trying to show them and put this in their everyday life. That every time they put on a woolen garment, they would be reminded, salvation is of faith. Every time they put on a linen garment, they would say, salvation is not of works. They would be reminded of this every day. They would see this symbology in their life. Because again, wool coming from a lamb, coming from a sheep is symbolic of faith. And the, the, the linen coming from a plant is symbolic of works. You say, oh, I don't know about that. Well, Cain and Abel. Yep. What did Cain bring? He brought the fruit of the ground, right? He brought plants. What did Abel bring? He brought a sheep, right? He brought the wool. He brought, well, of course, it was the blood, obviously. But that's all symbolic there. And he's bookending this, this year with uh, that verse there, verse 11. It's bookended by like verses that are symbolic in nature. They're, they're commandments, but the, the purpose of them is to serve as a reminder to God's people. Okay? <clears throat> he says there in verse 12, Thou shalt make thee fringes upon the four quarters of thy vesture, wherewith thou coverest thyself. So he's saying, you know, you're going to make these, you're going to fray out the ends. You have like these, these fringes, these, uh, and, he, and specifically, go over to Numbers 15. I know we're kind of running out of time, but there's a lot to cover tonight, but. We'll go through this real quick. Numbers 15, okay? What is he talking about here? Well, Numbers 15 kind of clarifies this for us. I'll start reading in verse 37, Numbers 15. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the border of their, of their garment throughout their generations. So this is the same commandment being reiterated. To make fringes in the borders of their garments. And it shall be unto you a fringe that ye may look upon it. So it wasn't so other people could look upon it, so that you could look upon it. You would see it on your own clothes. You would see it on your, father, your, your uh, fellow Israelites' clothes. You would, all, you would see this all around you. And it would be reminding you every day of what? And it shall be for you a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. That you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, <coughs> after which you used to go a whoring. That you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy under God. I am the Lord your God, uh, <coughs> which brought you out of the land of Egypt. So he's saying you're going to make these fringes and you're going to put a ribbon of blue in them. Why? To be reminded of God and his commandments and to keep them and to do them and not to seek after your own ways. So that's why these things are there. These daily reminders. I mean, God is working this right into their daily life. Right? He's saying the garments are going to be, one's going to be wool, one's going to be linen. You can't blend them. He's saying don't plow with an ox and axe together. When, when the clothes that you make are going to have a ribbon of blue, a fringe in it. Why? To remind them day in and day out and day in and day out and day in and day out who they are and who God is, and that they are to be different. <coughs> Let's go ahead and uh, we'll just move ahead here for, for sake of time. Go back to uh, verse Deuteronomy 22, look at verse 13. <coughs> so the kind of latter half here kind of deals with, you know, just to come out and say it deals with, you know, fornication and basically what we would call rape today. He says in verse 13, If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her, and give occasion of speech against her, and bring up an evil name upon her, and say, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Then the father of the damsel and her mother shall bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. 
And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasion of speech against her, saying, I have found thy daughter not a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city, and the elders of the city shall take that man and chastise him, and they shall immerse him. And immerse is just a word that means a financial penalty. That's what that is, to, to have an immersement put upon you being immersed as you being financially penalized. And he says, immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver and give, it unto the father, give them unto the father of the damsel. Okay? Because he hath brought an evil name upon a virgin of Israel. And, this shall, and she shall be his wife and may not put her away all his days. So this is a clause in there that a guy just couldn't marry a girl and then find out he doesn't like her and then just, you know, an attempt to just, you know, besmirch her character and get out of the deal. Say, oh, well, she wasn't a maid when I found her. You know, she, you know, she, she wasn't a virgin. And he's saying, well, no. We're going to prove that, you know, the, the, the tokens are going to be brought forth and, and where they're going to have, if it's found out that you're lying, you know, you're going to be chastised, you're going to pay the money and you're still going to be your wife, you know, so there goes your honeymoon money or whatever. Now you can't buy her the next nice thing. So anyway, so what really what we see out of this is that it should be a safe assumption that, that, uh, that, that people are going to the altar pure virgin, right? <laughs> See, the punishment here that was put on this guy that brought an evil report upon her was based on the fact that he thought she was virgin, right? He's, he's be, he was led to believe that the girl he was marrying, you know, was pure, right? And, he's now, and then he's bringing up the evil accusation and saying that she isn't. And what that should show us is that, you know, most people should, it should be safe to assume that it is the case with people. Now, that's not always the case, obviously. People make mistakes. So that's not, you know, you can't, you can't say... You know, if, if you don't know that, go, if, if you go into in marriage assuming that this other person, you know, or they've led you to believe that they are a virgin and it turns out they're not, then that means, yes, you could put them away. He said, well, it's, it's a found out she lied to me, you know, then yes, that would be annulled, you know, and, and that, that marriage then could be put away. But if it's found out that it's not the case, you know, then he has to stay with her. <coughs> And uh, we're going to move on here for sake of time. Verse 22, it says, uh, If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, so this is talking about if a married woman, is, if he goes and lies, he commits adultery, okay? They shall both of them die. <laughs> In 2020 America would love that, huh? They shall both of them die. Uh, the, both the man that lay with the woman and, and the woman. So they shall put away evil from Israel. Look, he's saying, why, why should they be put to death to put away evil from Israel? You know, I would rather somebody come kill me than sleep with my wife. I mean that. I would rather die than to find out my wife was committing adultery. Honestly, I can't imagine a more painful thing than adultery. And yet today, in our culture, it's flaunted. It's joked about. It's, it's, it's almost expected. Oh, you're married? When are you going to have your affair? They call it an affair, right? They, make it, they don't want to call it adultery. <laughs> it's, a, it's a horrible sin. And he's saying, look, if people do this, they should be put to death Amen. and put away e evil from Israel. You know, if every adult, all the adulterers were getting put to death, you know what? There'd be a lot less adulterers and not because they're all dying because when people see that's the punishment, they're going to say, whoa, yeah. well, I'm just going to keep my hands to myself. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to be happy with the wife that God's given me. And, I'm, and then evil is put away from that society, from Israel, right? So he says here, uh, <coughs> verse 23, if a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed to an husband, okay, she's, she's betrothed to this person, means she's going to be married, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then she shall bring, uh, uh, bring them out unto the gate of the city, and he shall stone them with stones that they die, the damsel, because she cried not. So he, she is as good as married, right? She's betrothed, she's engaged, you know, everyone knows she's going to be this man's wife. And if another man comes, and now this is saying specifically when it happens in the city, right? And if she cries not, then they both, that's, God says, well, that's the same as adultery, right? <coughs> uh, so shall I put away evil among you to the same end. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and force her, now that word force means against her will, okay? This is rape. This is what this is talking about. And lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. 
But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is no sin worthy of death. For when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. I mean, you know, rape is something that God <laughs> you know, is wicked. He says it's, 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 it's as if you're killing somebody. I mean, it's a horrible sin. And the Bible's making it real clear here that rapists should be put to death. And, and that's the truth. You know, if, if anybody, you know, and this, this is a sensitive topic to bring up because unfortunately a lot of people, um, you know, have suffered from this. You know, they've experienced this perhaps even in their own lives. You know, I know people personally that were, that were raped and it's devastating. I mean, it, it alters, it can alter a person's life completely. It just, it can change their direction in life, their thinking, the, the, the mental wounds, everything that goes along with the emotional trauma. It's a, you know, it's, it's a serious thing. <laughs> so much so that God says, kill him. Kill the rapist. Mm -hmm. Put him to death. <clears throat> and again, why? To put away evil from Israel. You know, women would be a lot safer if the rapists were putting to death, being put to death. You know, uh, it, it, there's so much of the evil that happens in our societies because people don't want to follow God's rules. Yep. You know, men are, you know, because a, a sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, the hearts of men are fully set in them to do evil, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes. And what that's saying is because God's law is not being carried out, because people aren't receiving the just punishment for their deeds, other wicked people look at that and say, oh, well, now it's my turn. That's not so bad. Oh, a few, a few years in prison for being a pedophile? Worth it. That's what they think. Now, if it was, oh, I'm going to be put to death swiftly, painfully, if I harm a child? Maybe I'll not do that. Oh, I'm going to be put to death if I rape a woman? Well, maybe I'll not do that. Oh, I'll be put to death if I go sleep with another man's wife? Maybe I'll not do that. Right. You know, it's a deterrent. It puts away evil. It makes people think twice. But when the th these things are not carried out in society, and we've been talking about a lot, this a lot lately, these last few weeks, because that's what's in the book of Deuteronomy. When these things are not carried out in society, men are, wicked people are emboldened to go out and do them. So he says there in verse 26, but unto the damsel that shall do nothing, uh, jump down to verse 27. For he found her in the field and the betrothed damsel cried and there was none to save her. Right? She's saying this isn't her fault. You know, that, that he, he, she was forced. And then people, you know, this is verse 28 is another where these, in these, these, uh, these, these idiot uh, atheists and stuff, they try to say, well, the Bible says you have to marry a rapist. Right? They go to verse 28 and say, if a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed and lay hold on her and lie with her and they be found. Now does it say forced? No, it says if you lay hold on her. Okay, there's a difference there. This is not rape. Okay, and they be found, right? It says, then the man shall lay, that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver and she shall be his wife. This is the shotgun wedding, right? You know, they think they're getting away with it. They're just going to go fool around out, out in the field and no one's going to be the wiser. Well, if they're found out, you know, it's ch -ch -ch, yeah, you're going to make an honest woman out of her. The shotgun wedding. Because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. Oh, and you're going to give him 50 shekels of silver while you're at it. So that term there, lay hold on her, that's not the same. Think of the term, lay, uh, thou shalt lay hands suddenly on no man. Right? When he's talking about ordination, about not you know, being quick to ordain somebody. You know, laying hold, putting your hands on somebody, that's not forcing. Okay? So that, that's the difference there. And they'll turn to this and say, oh, it's talking about raping. And it's like, no, that's not. It's different. Forcing her is what's considered rape. Laying hold on her would be, you know, seducing her, you know, sweet talking her. It would be all of these things, you know, that, that type of persuasion, laying hold on her and then laying hold on her, putting your hands on her and so on and so forth. <coughs> so, you know, uh, and then, so the Deuteronomy is just covering a lot of different things here tonight. You know, there's certain parts of the Bible where it's just, it just jumps, right? And you get, one, you get a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But he ends here in the end, verse 30, he says, a man shall not take his father's wife. Now, it should be safe to assume that he's talking about a stepmother, right? God, you know, God's not talking about incest here, although <laughs> he forbids that too. But he's saying, look, he's not going to take his father's wife nor discover his father's skirt. And he's talking about what I believe is you know, looking upon his nakedness, okay? So there's a lot of different things here, you know, and quite frankly, uh, there'd be a lot of great things that it would do us well in this country to enact. Because our country is going down a cultural gutter. And 
It's uh, because people are a bunch of bleeding hearts and that just want to apologize for every wicked individual who wants to act out on every wicked impulse that they have. And as unfortunately, as a result, you know, people suffer them un unnecessarily. And uh, <coughs> God gives us a lot of great laws that would benefit us. And, you know, we'll probably never see them come to pass in our lifetime. And certainly that's not what we campaign to do. You know, our, we, our, our government is very wicked. But uh, we, just, uh, we just know, you know, we solace ourselves in the fact that one day this will be the law of the land. When Christ returns, this is what's going down. Amen. This, is what, this is what God's going to dole out. You know, and it's going to be a rod of iron. And there's not going to be, there, there will be no, uh, you know, there's not going to be some, you know, movement or something like that. There's not going to be a Congress. You know, they're not going to just get more Democrats or Republicans in power and change God's rules. You know, it's, right. it's with a rod of iron. It's going to be swift. It's going to be perfect. And we look forward to that day. You know, the, the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect. You know, last few weeks we've read some things that, you know, if, if we hadn't heard them before, it might have kind of struck us and shocked us a little bit and caused us to go, whoa, does the Bible really say that? Is God's really God's how it feels about those people and these people and this and that? Yeah, that's how he feels about it, you know, and we should learn to love the Lord our God and we should learn to love his word and embrace it. Because again, all of these things are put into here for what? For our own good, that it may be well with us. That's why we should love these things. Let's go ahead and pray.